thanks thanks for the kind words uh, i'll just share my screen um yeah. um so again uh, we'll we'll cover the uh, the act the digital personal data protection act today and and primarily we'll try to keep it uh, simple and um, and and not get into uh, privacy jargon and not get into legal language right because that kind of uh, takes a toll on the audience uh, so we'll try to keep it simple the way uh, i'm uh, plan to structure today's discussion is uh, um, one um, uh, start with the setting a context so even before we get into the india digital personal data act right talk about uh, what is personal data and what is data privacy okay uh, then we get into the details of the act uh, wherein we talk about where is it applicable to what is it applicable to uh, who are the various players in this data privacy ecosystem uh, and, and and when we do that, we'll give you a sense of the type of terminology that is being used. Uh, what are the requirements from the act? And finally, the penalties. Okay, so we, primarily the session will focus on these two areas. I have some additional uh, areas uh, which I've kind of uh, put put up slides on. Um, while, uh, starting with how how does how do you really implement a privacy program? I'll delve on specific aspects uh, of it and not get into the details. Um, uh, and then finally, what are the opportunities for the uh, CA fraternity? Right. So I am. Uh, uh, I'm not fully aware of the kind of work that is done by uh, the CAs, right? So what I'll plan to do as part of this session is uh, really put up what are the skills required, what are the uh, type of trainings required, uh, right? So so that will, and then we'll, we'll um, get some feedback from you as to whether it makes sense, right? And finally, uh, for uh, CA firms, right? Part to compliance as to, uh, because you hold a lot of data from uh, of your customers, right? So how do you kind of, where do you start when uh, looking at complying to this act? Okay, so I'll start with the the, the first part, right? Uh, what is personal data? Okay, um, so personal data is any. It, it the definition is very broad, right? Any information uh, or data element that belong relates to an individual and using which you can directly identify an individual. Okay. Uh, so it could be directly identifying an individual could be the name of the individual, the address, their phone number, their email address, right? Use these data points are unique to an individual or there could be other data points, which are uh, using which you can potentially identify an individual, right? Right. Like their organization name or which education institutions that they studied or even things like their IP address, right? Which are not very uh, intuitive when you look at uh, uh, th these data points. Right? They're not intuitively, you don't think of these as personal data, but these could help identify an individual. Okay, so personal data could be the element, one element or a combination of data elements, which, uh, which can potentially identify an individual. Okay, so the, uh, the definition is very broad when we, uh, when we say what's personal data. Okay. And these are some examples of personal data, right? So, uh, uh, so we, we, uh, in, in Arka's parlance right uh, we try to divide this data into above the surface and below the surface so when we say above the surface we are talking about uh, the data which users are typically aware of right that these, these are my personal data elements because this is what uh, i would be sharing with an organization so data points like name uh, address uh, pan card aadhar card right or financial data like bank account details insurance details tf related data or it could be when you visit a hospital or a healthcare provider, you would be providing your medical records or fingerprints. Uh, when fingerprints, when you let's say uh, uh, try to get into your office, there could be uh, organizations could be using fingerprints to allow you in, right? So health and biometric data, right? Or it could be personal data could also be your religious beliefs, which religion you belong to, which caste you belong to, your political beliefs, right? Which political party are you associating yourself with, right? So all these data points we say are above the surface data points. People are normally aware that they either have provided this data or they know that they are aware that these are 
data points associated with them, right? But there's a vast universe of data uh, which typically the user is not aware of that is being collected from them, right? So uh, you, everyone these days uses mobile apps, right? So when you use or download a mobile app, you provide access to your contact list, access to locations, camera, right? To the, to the uh, app, uh, the organization which has developed the app, right? So, uh, so these are all personal data points being collected from you when you use the app, right? So where, where you're located, who, sometimes your contacts, uh, you know, through your camera, they can access your photos, videos that are there on your app. So these are also personal data points. Um, cookies and trackers, when you visit a, a website, then through cookies, uh, the, the, the particular website can track as to how many visits you made, which other sites you potentially visited, right? What are the content that you viewed? So these are some of the examples of data that is being collected through uh, when you visit a website. Through sensors, RFID tags, uh, data points like your location can be collected. Uh, from smart devices like smart TV, smart assistants, right? Health, smart health devices. So your details like your heart, uh, heart rate. What is your activity? How the how what, what distance have you walked? Right. So these data points. Uh, smart vehicles, right? All each all your vehicles uh, have these um, uh, RFIDs or trackers uh, installed with them within them through which you can track the vehicle right uh, what distance has it traveled what are the uh, driving habits what speed have you traveled right so all these uh, data is collected through iot devices and are used for various kind of analysis right um, if you look look at uh, internationally these data points are used to determine your insurance coverage uh, and soon I'm sure some of these will uh, um, come to India as well at, uh, as organizations are trying to figure out how to monetize the data points. Even things like data derived uh, about you through analytics, right? So um, uh, banks may look at all your transactions and say that, hey, this is a high net worth individual. This person has a high propensity to repay the loan. Right. So these data points would not have been provided by the user, but based on all your transactions, the organization has inferred. So these additional data points that the organization comes up with they are also considered personal data. Okay. So this is your entire vast universe set of uh, universe of personal data that you are looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And why is it important to know? Because when you look at data privacy, data privacy only applies to personal data. Okay, within the organization, there will be uh, organization carries non personal data as well as personal data. Non personal data could be something which is very specific to the organization, like uh, on annual revenue or their cost or working capital related information, right? Uh, and they and they would have some personal data about customers, employees, or vendors, right? Uh, or visitors, right? So data privacy is only applicable to personal data, it is not applicable to the overall data that is there within the organization. So it's important to um, remember this. Yeah. Um, so again, coming back to what really is data privacy. So you as an individual, uh, when you interact with uh, uh, an organization, let's say with a bank, right? So you want to open an account, you go and Pro give them all your information uh, around KYC related information, your name, Aadhaar, your address, man card, all this information you provide them, right? Um, and when you provide data to the bank, you also have certain expectations from the bank, right? So uh, you would have some expectations to really understand, hey, you're collecting all this personal data uh, from me, what are you going to use it for? Uh, are you only collecting data that you need or are you collecting more data than what's required? Are you really sharing it with any third party? Can I access my personal data? Can I correct it? Can I ask, request you to delete my data? Yeah. Have you taken my consent for all the actions that you plan to carry out with my data? Are you properly securing my data? Right. Now, all these expectations from an individual, right, that, that you see listed on here. Now, this forms the core of data privacy. 
right really understanding what the uh, how the personal data is going to be used whether the organization is collecting more than what's required uh, are they share which third parties are they sharing it with can an individual access the data uh, correct the data right uh, in organization taking consent for all the actions right so all these form the core of data privacy okay okay so now that we've seen what is personal data and what is uh, uh, data privacy let's look at the india dpdpa okay the uh, india digital personal data so again uh, just a brief context to the act uh, india has been attempting to pass this act since uh, 2018 and there were multiple revisions that were made to the act and uh, it, it almost seemed as if nothing was happening for a very long time and uh, frankly we even we didn't expect it to be released uh, in this session right but once um it 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 was uh, passed in the lok sabha it was tabled on uh, in the parliament on 3rd august then it was passed by the lok sabha passed by the rajya sabha and then uh, the president assent was also received by 11th august right so uh, it it just zipped through the parliament uh, uh, very quickly right uh, although it took almost 2 3 years uh, more than two, three years, right? For almost four, five, five years for this to happen, okay? Uh, and when it happened, it just uh, happened very fast, okay? So the act has been passed. Uh, there are certain rules under the act which are yet to be released, okay? Because obviously, as you know, right, even this law is at a very high level, right? It, it has certain requirements. But how, do, how, do, how does an organization implement these or what are the specifics, right? Those are yet to be defined and they... It was supposed to have been done in the uh, uh, at uh, in the next thirty days, right? But uh, it's um, it's it's clearly delayed. Uh, and once uh, the law is released, the uh, government will come up with a timeline by which organizations need to implement this, right? So it could be anywhere from six months to one year, right? Which uh, for us, these are very aggressive timelines, right? Because uh, if if you look at the uh, GDPR, which is the EU privacy law, right? It uh, they gave organizations around two years to implement, and even after four years, five years, organizations only almost maybe twenty percent of the organizations had fully implemented it. So these are all very complex, um, um, complex requirements, and especially for larger organizations, it could take anywhere from eighteen to twenty-four months to really implement it. Right, so uh, let's see uh, when when the rules are released. Yeah. Now, what is the uh, applicability? Right, so the it applies to uh, digital personal data processed in India. Okay, so and as well as if, even if it is processed outside India, but in relation to any activity that is related to offering any goods or services to uh, individuals in India. Right, uh, all these come under the purview of this act, right? So uh, if the organization is based in India uh, and the processing is happening in India, definitely yes. But even if you are an organization outside India um, uh, and if you are pro processing or providing some services through a website for uh, specifically for uh, people residing in India you will and collecting their personal data in that process, uh, this will still come under the purview of the act. Okay. Now, what is digital personal data? We looked at what's personal data. Now, personal data collected in a, a digital form, right? Digital form could be uh, data in uh, databases, uh, log files, right? These, uh, uh, these will come under the classification of uh, uh, personal data. Uh, Non-digital form, uh, it, it, uh, Personal data in paper form will not come under the purview. However, if the paper form is digitized subsequently, right, if it's scanned, so uh, then uh, this will still be considered as personal data. Okay, so uh, so this uh, act as such applies to digital as well as uh, uh, digitized uh, personal data. Okay. Uh, what is it not applicable to? If you're using the data for any personal 
purpose right so uh, then the act is not applicable or and it's also not applicable if the data is made public by the individual right so let's say they go and put up some information on the uh, on on social media right let's say um uh, then it's not applicable however this i'm sure there will be certain rules which will still come up around this uh, at this point this is uh, still a gray area so we expect some more details to come out with uh, uh, as part of this yeah okay um now, what is the now, now we've seen uh, uh, what kind of processing is it applicable to and what ty type of data are we talking about? Uh, the next point here is that uh, DPDPA will also apply to uh, uh, what kind of types of processing will the DPDPA be applicable to, right? So it is not just applicable for personal data collection, okay? The entire life cycle of your personal data when it enters the organization, uh, right from the time it enters the organization, right, uh, till the time it is destroyed. So the entire life cycle and all the actions that happen on that personal data, e each one of these uh, actions will come under the purview of data privacy, right? So if you see, this is just a list of action items, actions on personal data. You can collect it, you can record it, you can organize the data in various forms and databases. Uh, you can use the data, uh, you can merge two data sets, you can uh, uh, transfer the data to another uh, organization, right? Uh, you can destroy it, right? So all, all these actions come under the purview uh, of, of uh, the law. Yeah. So it's not just uh, data collection, but any action on the data uh, comes at the, the purview of the act. Yeah. Uh, now let's look at the various actors um, uh, as part of this. Yeah. So to start with, right, you uh, the individual whose personal data is processed, uh, the term used in the law is the, uh, this individual will be called as the data principle. Okay. So this, this individual is at the heart of everything, right? It is the individual whose personal data is being processed. Yeah. Uh, next is uh, you have the data fiduciary, right? So data fiduciary is the organization that decides what personal data needs to be collected? Why does it need to process that personal data and how it plans to collect it and how it plans to use it, right? So, uh, yeah, for example, when an individual goes to a bank, the bank decides what personal data they want from the individual to open the account, right? So the bank becomes a data fiduciary, right? So data fiduciary is the term used for organizations who are, uh, who decide what, personal data they want to collect, how they want to use it. Okay. Um, so this is the next data fiduciary is the next big role after data principle. Okay. Now the uh, data fiduciary may um, outsource some of their activities or processing of their personal data to another organization who does it on their behalf. Okay. Now this organization is known as the data processor. So let's say uh, the bank uh, decides to outsource their contact center to another organization, right? Because this outsourced party uh, is an expert in contact center management. Yeah. So all the calls from the customers is being attended by this contact center. So this organization is called as the data processor. Okay. So uh, the data fiduciary is accountable for all actions uh, of the actions of the data processor. And we look at some of the requirements um, um, uh, of, of, of uh, when it comes to data processors. Uh, now, there could be scenarios wherein uh, the data is collected by the data processor on behalf of the fiduciary, right? The bank may uh, have appointed an organization to collect data from the uh, from from the data principal or the or their customer, right? So uh, even in that scenario, the data pro this this particular organization that's collecting data, they are collecting it on behalf of the data fiduciary, right? So they still could be uh, would be classified as the data processor. Okay. 
Um, now there's another role which is uh, very specific to the Indian law. It's called the consent manager. So the consent manager is an organization which acts as a single point of contact. So let's say uh, a data principal has to provide will will end up providing their data to multiple organizations. So it's it's it it will lead to fatigue wherein they have to keep the uh, you know, let's say they have a banking product they have an insurance product or some other product they want to go uh, want to um, purchase and uh, they have to keep giving their consent which kind of leads to fatigue right so uh, you have uh, the role of a consent manager which is an organization which provides a platform for the data principal to uh, and the data principal will say that hey uh, um, i am okay to provide my consent to these 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 type of activities okay and i'm giving you uh, my consent for this so uh, the, the consent manager uh, 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 will kind of store all these consents and if any bank um, or any other organization wants to get the consent, they will re directly reach out to the consent manager, know that, okay, hey, this uh, individual has provided consent for XYZ activities and they'll just use that. And if uh, their consent is not there, they don't need, they can't use the data, right? So it's it's like a central, consent manager is a central organization whose main job is to manage the consent for the data principle, right? So data principle can uh, provide consent, withdraw consent. So all these consents are managed by this consent manager and data fiduciary will use the consent manager uh, based on the, uh, to, to see what kind of activities has the data principle consented for. Okay. Um, now, data, uh, you have the data fiduciaries, a subset of data fiduciaries uh, who, uh, who, who are involved in uh, highly risky personal data processing. Okay. Um, uh, these would be termed as significant data fiduciaries. Okay. So the government is yet to define uh, the exact parameters, but it could be based on the type of data processed by these organizations, volume of data, uh, right? So uh, the, the government will um, provide those specific uh, details as to who would be termed as significant data fiduciaries. Uh, now, these data, significant data fiduciaries, just by the name, right, they will have some additional obligations, right? Uh, because of because the uh, pro data processing is risky, they need to appoint a data protection officer who's an individual within the data fiduciaries uh, or significant data fiduciary who will be responsible to uh, ensure that the organization complies to this uh, law. Yeah, so the DPO. Uh, they also have to, uh, significant data fiduciaries also have to appoint a data auditor. Okay, uh, and data auditor is an independent body who will uh, evaluate uh, the significant data fiduciary from time to time to ensure that they comply with the law. Yeah, so so these are two roles which are specific to uh, significant data fiduciaries. Uh, overall, the management of the act or the governance, the name of the regulator is the Data Protection Board of India or just the board. Uh, and this regulator will check for non-compliances, uh, impose penalties, uh, step in if uh, there has been a breach, right? So these, uh, so this is the data protection board, who's the regulator, okay? And the central government is there who works with the regulator, maybe appoint the regulator also, decide on the rules as to um, uh, what will comprise the uh, significant data fiduciaries or some other requirements, which we'll see further down around cross-border data transfer. Yeah, But these are some of the key roles as far as the uh, act goes. And these are some terminologies you need to get familiar with. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, just to give a flavor, these are for an organization, these are your typical type of data principles, right? Organization deals with the customers, employees, uh, they've got visitors, they've got third party vendors, right? And these are some sample data points which they, they would have for each of these individuals, right? customers you would have name contact email depending on whether you are b2b b2c right if you are a b2c you would have more data points uh employees you have a lot of personal data associated uh, similarly third party vendors it will be limited won't be much and similarly for visitors as well yeah now let's get into the requirements what does the act uh, say right uh 
the first concept that we need to understand is something called as the legal grounds of processing personal data. Under what circumstances can you process personal data? Okay. So the most important one is uh, consent, user's consent. User consents to uh, saying that, okay, I consent to you, uh, uh, Mr. Data Fiduciary, to use my data for XYZ purposes, right? So, um, and consent is supposed to be uh, freely provided uh, without any under, without <coughs> the individual being under any duress. Um, uh, the user should be informed of exactly what he is he or she is consenting to uh, in the language that they are comfortable with and there should be an affirmative action right so uh, example of an affirmative action is you go tick a box saying that hey i consent to you using my data for whatever purposes right so typically <laughs> anything related to marketing sales it it is uh, the typical legal ground would be consent okay uh, however there are certain other legitimate uses of the data. Um, so the first one is voluntary submission. So so let's say, for example, you put, make a, um, uh, let's say you order food online, right? Uh, through Danzo or any of the food delivery apps. The organization like a Zomato will process your address so that they deliver the food to your exact address, okay? So in this scenario, to provide the service that has been requested, the organization has to use the data. Okay, so, uh, and in this case, you would have, uh, a user would have provided their data wallet, uh, voluntarily, right? So in this case, consent is not required because it's critical for completion of the service that uh, the, 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 the personal data has to be processed, in this case, the address, right? Um, next is uh, legal obligation, let's say, uh, a bank, uh, you go to a bank, you want to open an account, the bank uh, has to co collect KYC related data, right? Um, because they have they, they have a legal obligation based on anti-money laundering laws, right? Based on which they have to undertake certain customer due diligence, right? So for this, they don't need the customer's consent, right? Because they're doing it based on another um, uh, law, yeah? Um, public interest, right? So administration of justice, tax, collection, census, etc. So these come under uh, public interest. You have vital interest. So vital interest is medical emergencies, right? The hospital, there's an accident that has happened and the uh, user is, the data principal is in no state to consent to anything, right? So uh, to save the person's life, the uh, hospital has to use their past, let's say the patient's past record, uh, their blood group related details, et cetera, to ensure that they survive, right? So, so this is vital interest. And finally, employment purposes, right? So uh, organization uh, with employees have to process a lot of the employees' data, personal data, right? Either for background checks or to pro provide the, or deposit their salary in a particular account or for tax-related purposes, right? So uh, all this uh, 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 data can be used under the legal ground of employment purpose, yeah? So, so, so again, uh, 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 what an organization needs to do is uh, really list down what are the types of users that uh, uh, of personal data that they have and try to map it to a particular one of these legal grounds, okay, either consent or any of the other legitimate users. So, and wherever the organization sees that it doesn't fit into any other category for those, they have to get the individual's consent. Yeah, and the consent again. There are requirements around consent that you need to store the consent. There has to be an audit trail. Uh, uh, the user should be able to withdraw consent as easily as they have provided consent. So all these requirements are additional requirements are there. So it's a complex topic in itself. Consent. Okay. So this is the first thing. Uh, you can use the data. Uh, but you have to have certain legal grounds, either the uh, individual has provided their consent or the data use is based on any of the legitimate uses listed down here. Yeah. Uh, now there are certain key principles <clears throat> when you per process the personal data, right? So uh, first of all, organization should have a very clear purpose for processing. They can't just 
without any clear purpose, they can't just collect the data. So there has to be a clear purpose for processing. These need to be documented. Uh, you either need to get the individual's consent or base they, it should be based on the any of those legitimate uses that we saw on the, the earlier slide. Okay. Uh, once you collect the data, uh, when you're collecting the data, uh, you need to provide a notice to the user. Okay. So this privacy notice is the is a statement, is kind of a transparency statement which provides um uh, the user with details of the personal data processing practices which the organization follows. Okay, so typically uh, a notice is something that you would see in any organization's website, right? It is either called a privacy policy or it's called privacy statement. Yeah, so typically it contains information like what kind of personal data that they process, what are they, what do the organization use it for, uh, what categories of uh, organization do they share it with, how long they store the data, right? So these are kind of information that is typically present in the privacy notice. Okay, now. Um, once you've collected the data, you need to also ensure that you use the data for only the purposes for which the user is consented, right? Or the legitimate purposes, other legitimate uses, nothing beyond it, right? Okay. So this is called purpose limitation and privacy jargon. I'm not going to <laughs> for, uh, give more jargons, but in simple words, you collect data, you use it only for the users uh, that, that, that have been agreed with the user. Okay, you provide them with a notice uh, so that they are aware of what they're getting into. Um, also, the other concept is you need to collect only the information that is needed for that particular purpose, right? So let's say uh, you are, uh, let's say, um, if you're a food delivery app, you may collect the name, address, phone number, but you don't need to collect the contact lists of the user or um, uh, get access to their uh, SMSs, uh, right? Uh, so collect only what's needed for this, the, the purpose, right? Because the law also states that if anything, ex you collect anything excess, then we would assume that the user is not consented. So you will be violating the law anyways, yeah. Um, next is, uh, once the data has been used, right, to delete the data after the purpose has been served, right? Uh, or, and there could be a couple of scenarios, right? You collected the data, but now the user has withdrawn the consent. So you need to then delete the data. Um, uh, or if you said that you've collected the data and you've said that we'll retain the data for XYZ period. And so once that period is over, you need to delete it, yeah? Uh, typically, this again is a very complex topic. Data retention is a complex topic because there are other laws which also um, uh, have have a say in how long you need to retain the data, right? Like for employee data, there'll be labor laws or tax related laws which dictate the data to be retained for a certain amount of time. So it's not uh, so the privacy law will not specify any any specific date. It's typically guided by other laws, right? So again, a topic where a lot of organize, most organizations are lagging and it's a very complex topic and um, we are still trying to figure out with the clients that we work with as to how, how do we really implement this. Yeah. So this will be one of the pain points when you start implementing the program. Um, there are other obligations of a data uh, fiduciary. So let's say when engaging data processors, right? So we saw data processors are organizations to whom um, you have outsourced certain activities, right? So employee payroll processing, you may have outsourced or uh, customer data center, uh, contact center, you have outsourced, right? So uh, the, what the law says is that if you outsource any activities or use data processor, you need to ensure that you have a valid contract in place and the contract should have privacy and information security related clauses with the data processor needs to be uh, needs to adhere to okay so the contract should have all the requirements uh, and uh, the data fiduciary the, as in the organization that's outsourcing right they need they are accountable so if anything goes wrong with the data processor the 
uh, organization which had outsourced the fiduciary is still accountable. So there are a lot of practices which they need to put in place. So some of the typical practices are during um, onboarding the vendor, doing those due diligence, having privacy as part of the due diligence, right? Um, uh, ensuring that the contract is in place and then uh, once the work starts, then ensuring that uh, um, there are ongoing aud audits that happen, right, with the uh, with the vendor. Um, next is provide security safeguards, right? So ensuring that uh, there is a strong information security program in place to prevent any uh, data uh, uh, breaches or impact on data of, uh, confidentiality, integrity, or availability of personal data, right? So uh, the, the data fiduciary has to implement a robust security uh, uh, safeguard. So uh, typically the data privacy program works very closely with the information security program in the organization. Uh, breach notification, right? So if any personal data is breached, okay, so then uh, there are two types of notifications that need to go out. One is the data protection board or the regulator needs to be notified uh, that, hey, uh, this breach has happened and as typically as part of that uh, notification, you talk about how many users have been impacted, how many data points have been breached, what kind of data points have been breached, uh, what actions have you uh, taken, and uh, uh, and are you taking some long term measures to ensure that uh, uh, this doesn't happen again, right? So these kind of details need to be shared with the data protection board. Uh, the other data uh, notification needs to go out is to the data principal, right? The uh, impacted individual, right? Uh, so they need to be notified that what kind of data has been breached and if there's any uh, any action that they need to take to protect themselves, then uh, that needs to be conveyed as well. Um, so at this time, typically, if you look at privacy laws, uh, the regulators are clear as to what timeline, within what timeline does does a breach need to be notified to the uh, regulator. Here, we are yet to define it. This law is yet to define that. Yeah. Other laws have clearly uh, mentioned what kind of, uh, what's the timeline and what details need to be notified. Okay. Um, uh, next is grievance redressal. The uh, the data principal should be able to um, raise a grievance, and that grievance once it's raised, that needs to be processed in an effective uh, manner uh, by the organization. Uh, so there should be good, strong uh, grievance redressal mechanisms. Um, uh, the data once the data is there with the organization uh, the data needs uh, organization needs to take measures to ensure accuracy of the uh, personal data of the user right especially this becomes even more important when uh, you, uh, the organization is making certain decisions uh, of, of about the user based on the data right so think of it this way right if the organization has to take a call on should we provide a loan to this individual or not or should we provide this, uh, offer uh, this job to a particular uh, applicant. And if the data uh, uh, basis which they make the decisions is inaccurate, then it's going to impact the user. So ensuring accuracy of the uh, data is critical. Yeah. Uh, finally, transferring personal data outside India, right? So uh, the government has said that, hey, uh, you, you can transfer the data to any country, but to uh, uh, certain, uh, but you may, uh, you will have to restrict it to certain countries, uh, which, but the list has not been published by the government as yet, right? So uh, the organizations would need to um, uh, at least have a docu documentation on where is their personal data going, which countries is it going to. So at some point of time in the future, if the government comes out with the list, you, you would know, okay, uh, are, do, are any of those transfers falling into the list of countries which has been published by the government and then hence what actions need to be taken. Okay. Um, um, we spoke about additional obligations of significant data fiduciaries, right? So they need to appoint a data protection officer who's an internal, uh, someone internal to the organization, uh, someone uh, senior enough uh, to uh, report to the board or uh, be part of the senior management. And this individual will be uh, uh, responsible to ensure compliance, right? Uh, so there are 
requirements of a data protection officer but typically it should uh, the, uh, the role should not any have any conflict with any other role where personal data processing happens right so it shouldn't be that the data protection officer is also the chief analytics officer of the organization wherein they process a lot of personal data so that those role related conflicts should be avoided um, the significant data fiduciaries need to appoint a data data auditor to carry out data audits so external this should be an external body Lastly, uh, they need to conduct periodic data protection impact assessments called DPI. Uh, so DPI is, uh, uh, so whenever there is a change in the organization uh, and this change could be um, their organization is releasing new products or they're um, uh, revising a process, uh, revising some technology basis, which uh, there can be an impact on privacy, right? And when we say data privacy, it could be it could mean that you're collecting more information uh, about uh, an individual based on this change, or they uh, you may be wanting to use the data in a new way, uh, or uh, you are merging two data sets so, uh, of an individual. So now you have access to two x data points of an about an individual. So it could be anything. So any of these changes uh, uh, which can impact privacy. Uh, there needs to be a data protection impact assessment that needs to be conducted. Okay, so uh, again, the details have not been provided as to what what should be the triggers. What, but typically, if you look at other laws, um, uh, they would have a clear mechanism in terms of what should the reporting should lo uh, look like. Uh, in laws like GDPR, in fact, if one of the based on the assessment, if uh, high risk, if the uh, new product or new process is supposed to be high risk, then you need to inform the regulator. So all these details have not been published as of now. We'll get to know. It's it's been only been stated that the organization needs to conduct this assessment. Okay. Um, next is they need to conduct some internal audits uh, and any other measures to monitor the program, right? So any other measures could be ensuring privacy related KPIs or metrics are measured. Uh, you uh, you are having management reviews and those inputs from the management are considered, right? So these are some of the requirements of a significant data fiduciary. And these are at least standard ones when, when you're looking at uh, monitoring or managing a privacy program. Yeah. Um, now, the uh, Act also uh, provides certain um, rights to the individual. Okay, So the individual can ask the organization, hey, I want to understand uh, access information about my personal data. So what personal data are you processing? Uh, what activities are you undertaking? Uh, where have you, which other organizations have you shared my data with? Uh, what exactly, what exact data points have you shared um, with these organizations, right? So all uh, uh, um, uh, an individual can actually reach out to an organization and ask for all these details. Um, typically, again, if you look at other laws, there are certain timelines within which organization needs to process this. Uh, in GDP, in the EU, as per the EU law, it's 30 days and there is some extension period. But these uh, timelines are yet to be defined in, in the law uh, here. Yeah. Um, then you have right to correction. Uh, so individual can reach out to an organization to correct any data which is incomplete or outdated. Um, individuals can also reach out to an organization for erasure of the data. So it's important to remember that uh, th things like erasure or even correction are not absolute rights, okay? Because an organization just can't erase the data uh, because they would, they would have to maybe retain it for other purposes, right? Because they, they, they need to maintain it for um, based on some other laws, Right. So these are not absolute rights. And when the rules come out, I'm sure there'll be a lot of details around uh, erasure of the personal data, which uh, will, will uh, which will come out. But it's uh, um, again, this is a, a very tricky um, right. And if you if you especially if you look at trends in EU, uh, this is uh, erasure as well as data retention. These are some of the more difficult requirements to meet for an organization. 
Okay. Um, similarly, the right to grievance redressal is again, uh, user can raise a grievance and these need, would need to be addressed within a certain timeline. Um, right to nominate. So, uh, data principal can nominate um, uh, a trusted individual who can exercise their rights in case they're incapacitated. Right. So, um, so this is a new one. Uh, right to nominate is something which is very unique to the Indian um, Indian law, uh, Indian uh, Data Privacy Act. Yeah. Uh, so the organizations again here need to implement processes and mechanisms to handle these requests. So. Uh, they need to provide clear portals uh, where uh, users can raise these requests uh, as part of their privacy notice. They need to make it clear as to what are the rights of the individual, how they can exercise these rights. And one of the key processes when you, the organization really implements this, uh, the, the, the processes around these rights is also around verifying the individual's identity when uh, when when they're reading the rights because else it, this could be another way in which personal data about individuals can so easily go out right so verification is a very critical process once an organization decides how to um, uh, implement this um now let's look at what are the penalties these are the requirements yeah. so the penalties again uh, there are various slabs of penalties um so for the ones in blue are for the uh, data fiduciary okay so uh, 250 crore up to 250 crores for if uh, organization has not implemented uh, security safeguards uh, to uh, up to 200 crores if um, uh, they have not provided uh, notifications around data breaches um, uh, to, uh, up to 200 crores if uh, the children's related data uh, uh have not been met so one thing i would want to mention here is for children's data uh there are certain uh, additional obligations to organizations especially if they are processing children's data uh, uh when you're processing children's data then the parental consent should be provided that's one and the other point is that um, uh, targeted advertising uh should not be uh, uh allowed and any 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 activity which is detrimental to the uh, child's well-being right that that those are not allowed okay so uh, so specifically they have they are talking about children's data um any uh, for significant data fiduciary any uh, obligation that they're missing it's uh, the, the uh, penalty is around 150 crores yeah and 50 crores up to 50 crores for any breach of any other provision of the act yeah uh, there is also a penalty for a data principal so if they if any data principal raises some frivolous uh, requests or grievances or if they don't provide um, the, the, the right documents when they're raising certain requests right or if they're trying to impersonate individuals so these uh, they could uh, have a fine of around 10000 uh, rupees around this yeah So, so these are the uh, really the requirements around the act right now. Um, when an organization decides that they want to implement a privacy program, right, they need to follow a certain uh, structured frameworks, right. Uh, so I'll just briefly touch upon some key aspects around implementation. Okay, this is a big topic in itself. So I'll touch upon some of the key bits here, right. Um, so typically when an organization needs, would want to implement the DPDPA, so the, the DPDPA has certain privacy principles, user rights, and uh, I'm sorry, there's data subject, it's data principle rights, and then organizational obligations that are there, right? Uh, now, all these requirements need to be translated into policies, processes, technology controls, so need to train the people, right? Uh, because the law will only talk about what the what's right but the hows are not mentioned anywhere right so the uh, so to uh, to really know the hows uh, you need certain frameworks okay and there are privacy frameworks like the iso 27701 or uh, there's a data security council of india so they have their own framework uh, the uh, dsci privacy framework dpf or there's a british standard ds10012 there's a american standard nist um uh, arca we have developed our own privacy framework so privacy frameworks mainly um 
to talk, also talk about not just the what but the hows uh, how to implement the program right and then provide a set of guidances or controls which the organize which any organization can use to structure their program okay uh, and these frameworks typically are law agnostic because uh, the the scenario today is that one single organization has to comply to multiple laws right so having a standard set of uh, um, uh, um, requirements, right? Uh, which which cuts across laws is uh, what these frameworks have. Yeah, so it's it's good to follow a framework because it will give you a certain structure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and based on our experience, right, how, as to how to implement, uh, uh, typically uh, when you when we go to a large organization, because privacy is could be a very disruptive exercise, right? So if it's a large organization, we recommend you take up one product or one vertical or uh, right one process to implement privacy. If it's a small organization, you may want to look at certain very core processes that you for where where you want to start from, right? Else, uh, if you try to boil the ocean, uh, it could really lead to uh, failure of the program. Okay, uh, we follow a, a five step approach. Uh, the first step is when we uh, lay the foundation of the program and I'll talk about what that encapsulates. But when we say lay the foundation, it's we really try to understand what kind of personal data the organization has, how is it using it. Yeah. Um, then uh, that's stage one and then we get to designing the program elements. So program elements could be designing the incident management process or a deep uh, data protection impact assessment process, right? So these are various or da data principle rights request management process. So these are some design elements. And then we implement it. When we say implement it, then uh, we, we hand over the uh, implementing the designs uh, onto your workflows or and training the individuals, handing over the responsibilities, right? So that's implementation. Manage and sustain is once the program is on, you need to manage it and you need to then ensure training. So training is not really the last, last step. It could happen at any point of time in the entire process. Yeah. Um, so the most important step, uh, which would not be listed in any law here, right? But the most important step for an organization is to really build something called as the personal data attribute map. Okay. Um, when they start, right. When they start the program and as part of this uh, uh, personal data attribute map, you would want to understand, Hey, what kind of personal data is being processed? Uh, and you would want to understand where, what are the various channels, if it's websites, mobile apps, so uh, things which the user provides, things which are being collected from the user through permissions, right, or things which are generated by your organization as part of uh, the transactions or derived, right, or if you're collecting data from third parties, right, so as, as part of the marketing team, you would collect leads from third parties, right, so, um, so all these various channels you need to understand and really prepare this map of what data is being collected, uh, personal data is being collected, uh, where is it being stored, which applications, locations, uh, how, what's the flow, with where, which applications does this uh, touch, uh, is it crossing geographies, uh, how is it being used by various things, because all these, unless you know what is really happening with your personal data, how do you even get to the step uh, stage wherein you're saying, is my organization uh, really respecting all these privacy principles or not, right? So you would want to understand you know, um, tomorrow the government may come up with a list of countries where uh, uh, you can't send data. So to really understand whether you're compliant or not, you would want to understand where is my personal data going to. Um, similarly, uh, if I want to ensure I, I really map the legal grounds of processing, then I need to understand what are the various purposes for which I'm using my data. So based on all the requirements of the law, you need to collect certain base information. And this is this activity is what we call as a PDAM. So this is like an absolutely critical activity, uh, which would not be mentioned in any law, but is part of all the key privacy implementation frameworks. So this is something that you need to do. Yeah. Um, 
yeah once you do that you get into design i won't touch much upon it but but to design an internal privacy policy you uh, design the privacy notice where, which is which goes up on your website right which has all your notice related requirements you have to establish a privacy organization right uh, uh, build uh, document the legal grounds uh, define your consent life cycle management process how how what would be the text for your consent where would you store it how can the user withdraw it right um, process for user rights requests or and grievances uh, you will have to set up pro uh, processes to ensure you do due diligence on third parties coming in ensure contracts have the right clauses um, yeah and processes around data retention uh, cross border data flows yeah ensuring security is there uh, yeah training users are trained as part of your accountability and then you manage monitor your program through kpis audits right external audits if based on um, or, or conduct data protection impact assessment so these are various processes you would need to implement yeah and again you, when you implement the program typically you would have various work streams and you would run these in parallel to just from a speed perspective yeah and again it's important to understand that even though there are so many uh, various areas they are all interlinked which makes it a very complex program to implement right so a simple request for data erasure will you will have to implement a verification mechanism to ensure the right person is requesting erasure you need to refer to your personal data attribute maps or personal data inventory to know where your data is located if it's a third party and you and someone's asking for data correction then you need to inform these third parties right so multiple aspects of your program are interlinked which makes it a very complex uh, program to implement yeah okay so opportunities for the CA fraternity, right? Some, my thoughts and would welcome some uh, I, um, points from the audience as well, because uh, I'm not an expert uh, in, in really understanding what, what, what are the activities done by the CA, but these are some areas where um, the CAs uh, have options, right? Auditor, uh, uh, as an internal auditor to the organization, as I said, it's one of the requirements, especially for significant data fiduciaries. But even for regular data fiduciaries, they would need some mechanism to ensure that the organization is complying, right, uh, to the law, right? Uh, external or as an external auditor, again, I'm not sure how legitimate this is, whether uh, the the CA would want to take this up, but this is uh, external auditor. I'm sure the uh, the regulator will come up with specific requirements uh, for for the uh, external auditors uh, as consultants, yes, and as data protection officer. The thing is, within the India law, the data protection officer has to be someone within the organization, right? Um, so I'll talk about, um, yeah. Typically, where does the data privacy office reside within the organization, right? That will also give you a clue as to how easy, how difficult is it for CAs to play this role, right? So uh, based on global trends, almost 41% of uh, organizations have data privacy residing within legal, okay? 23% uh, within regulatory compliance, 13% in InfoSec, right? And there's a... Uh, rest other 24 percent is a mix right what we've seen in these others you would have it sometimes it sits under it under data governance which is a very it's something which we've been observing lately uh data privacy um office residing within data governance okay um so this is a trend um uh, these are some of the requirements or uh, of of um uh, of someone working in the privacy team right uh, developing policies, procedures, governance, awareness and training, addressing issues with products and services, following legislative developments, performing impact assessments, right? So there's a whole load of things that need to be done. So you'll have to take a look at this and see, figure out whether it fits into your um uh, in, in in into some things that the CA fraternity does right so you may want to look at certain activities where you, uh, your expertise will be uh, 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 will, will will make sense yeah 
Um, these are some of the skills needed, um, legal expertise, risk management, understanding of IT because of that entire personal data map protection, uh, personal data inventory or personal data attribute maps, right? Um, you will have to, um, uh, a data protection officer will have to have, have the ability to communicate across levels, right? Right from the board to senior management to middle management to, 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 to right to the people who are, who are the, like the first line of defense, right? So, um, ability to work across levels and across functions, right? Because most of these processes will cut across functions. Yeah. And because of the siloed nature of working, it's very difficult uh, to have a direct answer as to how the data is being used because each function may be using it in different ways, right? And they will, there may be certain functions which will be collecting additional data. So it's really important to, uh, for the data protection officer to have the, the skill of, uh, of operating across functions. It's not easy, right? Program management skills, strong program management skills. Uh, they need to be a self-starter. They uh, need to kind of grab the bull by the horn. Uh, as I said, I one of these points I mentioned earlier, no role conflicts. And finally, the ability to train, right? Train employees or even senior members of the organization on what data privacy is. So these are some of the skill sets I said I thought better lay it out so that you can base uh, you would have a better understanding on what may work for you and which areas where you think it's uh, it would be a challenge. Yeah, and these would be for the roles of I would say the consultant or a data protection officer, right? As an auditor, I'm sure uh, I think uh, internal auditor. Uh, you, you, you even if you want to do the role of an internal auditor. It, would be important for you to really understand some of some of these um, program, privacy program management aspects. Yeah. Uh, so, so again, to gain these skills, what do you need to do, right? So there are certain um, trainings and certifications you need to gain. There are certain DPDPS specific trainings. And um, so ARCA has um, um, partnered with this organization, International Academy, and we uh, it's called the Global uh, 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 talent group, right? GTT, and we have come up. We have formed an organization called the International Academy of Data Governance (IADG). So we've just released a course on which will provide an intro to the DPDPA, and we'll be uh, coming up uh, very soon with a course which has a details of uh, DPDPA. Right? So each of these aspects that we just covered in a minute, a couple of minutes, is covered in great detail. Right? So these are certain law DPDPA specific trainings you may want to undergo to really gain those skills. <clears throat> there are certain um, data privacy related trainings and certifications available in the market. Uh, the Data Security Council of India has uh, uh, DCPP and DCPLA courses, uh, which is for privacy professionals and privacy lead auditors. Uh, they, it's not specific to the DPDPA, but it's, as I said, the DSEA has their framework. So if you want something local, then this is an option. IAPP, which is the International Association of Privacy Professionals, uh, provides uh, the these courses. The CIPM, which is a Certified Information Privacy Manager, uh, which is a very good course for someone who wants to understand uh, program management, how do you manage a privacy program. And then there are certain law-specific courses. So there is perhaps, uh, Certified Information Privacy Professionals, but these are uh, very law-specific. So they have one for Europe, US, uh, for Brazil, uh, and for Asia. So they will be, I'm sure they'll come up with something for India very soon. Okay. And they have something for CIPT, which is for privacy, uh, technical uh, technology professionals. Okay. So these are some of the certifications. So uh, ARCA, we are certified training providers for all the courses that you see below, right? The above and the ones on the top are something that we have ourselves developed. Yeah. Um, and the last point was around part to compliance, right? So as CA firms, you are collecting data for from your customers. You would have some employees whose personal data you would be processing, right? So what's the part to compliance? And we looked at earlier as to what are the things you need to do in a program, right? Um, right. So as I said, I'm just listing down three points here. Uh, one is initiate your program by conducting the foundational step, right? Developing that personal data attribute map, right? And it could be for your customer data, for your employee data. 
Yeah. Second is something that again you can run in parallel is this initiate staff training, right? So that at least one bit about accountability is taken care of. Um, uh, and as I said, you can avail of these training programs. Uh, Arka, as I said, has developed something for for with uh, GTT, which is <clears throat> now part of the International Academy of Digital Governance. Right. So there's something you can do. The intro module is something that they can take, right? And lastly. Or the smaller firms, at least, right? You, uh, one of the things, uh, as you see, there are a lot of requirements and it's very difficult uh, uh, and the expertise also is not available in the market. Uh, one of the things uh, we would recommend is for the smaller firms, go use a privacy management platform, which will reduce your documentation effort because all every, everything will be available on the platform. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you can store all your personal data attribute maps there. Uh, the uh, the uh, platform will have modules on DPI, so you don't need to create your own policies. Uh, uh, everything will be available on the platform, right? So, um, Arka, we have our own platform for the small and medium business segment. Uh, we call it the Arka Privacy Management Platform. Uh, but uh, this is something, at least for the smaller uh, uh, we we had developed it for the SMEs, uh, but this this will be something which you can jump, use to jumpstart your program, right? Uh, we developed this, but uh, currently what we are seeing is that even the larger players are asking us to um, uh, to to kind of help, let them use the platform as well. But it was primarily developed for uh, SMEs. So th these are broadly two three things for uh, the smaller firms which you would recommend at least start the program, start the training, and if possible. Or you may want to use a platform, right, to reduce your burden because you would not have a full time, you would not have the resources for a full time uh, privacy person or even someone um, because this again is a very new field, right? You would not have the skill sets available in the market, so it's a big challenge. Okay, okay, so that's it. I think from my side, this seven thirty. So we have about fifteen minutes for Q and A. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sandeep. That was really very informative. I think you've got everybody in the audience, you know, glued on and glued on to the, uh, you know, or to the monitors, because there's so much that as an auditor, we would be uh, privy to and uh, to relook at the data with a fresh set of eyes and say that, okay, is this a personal data? How do I protect it? What do I do? So one of the, the questions that we have received from uh, Shahin is, uh, Sandeep ji, when dealing with overseas-based clients, if their data, like shareholder information, is to be shared with, say, income tax department, etc., what if the overseas client restricts its tax consultant from doing so? saying as European Union regulations, this data cannot be shared. How do we respond to our client as it's mandatory to share with the Indian Income Tax Department? Um, so typically, uh, uh, as, as part of your contract itself, you should have uh, these clauses in place that if a uh, requirement comes from a regulator, you need to share this information, right? Couple of things you need to ensure is you are informing the clients in advance that, hey, this request has come, we would need to share this information. Second is uh, agree with the client as to what information will go out, right? Only the ones which are requested and nothing excess goes out. These are some processes you may want to put in place. But um, these, I think, if you have to share, you have to share, right? It's part of your regulatory requirements. And th this should be made clear at the time of signing up uh, with, with, with the client. The, thank you for that. Now, the second question that we have received from Parag is, will PD, PDA, uh, will ensure the personal data by credit card real estate companies selling to each other for marketing calls. So will it, I, I think what he's saying is, will this particular act uh, also um, affect the personal data, which is, you know, these credit card companies and all share with each other, your data is then picked up 
say you go to an exhibition and you drop your card and then suddenly you start getting calls from all these various uh, unsolicited cold calls yeah yeah so uh, yes so this will put a stop to that because uh, again the organization would need your consent uh, for for any of this activities when so organizations typically even if they are sharing data within other entities within the group companies have to have certain uh, um, uh, contracts in place with the other group companies uh, so yes, it will go down. Uh, I won't say it will stop from day one, right? So uh, there because it. I mean, there are bigger fish to fry, right? So, but I'm sure it will trickle down, and eventually it will it will hit these uh, uh, smaller organizations as well. Of course, if you're a big fish, you have a lot to lose, right? If you just look at the penalties, and even some of these also will lead to a lot of. Um, um, impact from a branding brand perspective so organizations would want to avoid any of these uh, murky practices so so yes it will go down uh, i guess it will start with the larger organization and eventually trickle down thank you so even i mean while of course the bigger organizations have deeper pockets to be able to deal with this kind of uh, you know requirement in terms of compliance uh, even the smaller firms will need to now up their game in terms of because you know a lot of this data is available say for example you do a vendor audit you do a customer audit all this data comes to us we do have our own mechanisms and frameworks to store it but yes you have given us a lot of food for thought in terms of saying okay what was the data originally given for and also the need to ensure that it is used specifically for the purpose it was given for and then ultimately at the right time to ensure that it is deleted because that sometimes you know just remains in the file though it is protected so actually going and deleting that data and getting that uh, uh, probably even confirmed by with the client that this data has got deleted uh, by us will be a very critical uh, process to follow. So I do see that both in terms of the, um, you know, the opportunities for a chartered accountant in the various roles that you mentioned, be it an auditor, be it a consultant, be it somebody who does training, or even a data protection officer. But similarly, we would also have uh, certain obligations placed on us in terms of the data that we are privy to uh, of the clients. Uh, so I, I think we don't have, okay, there is one more question which has come in. Uh, when accessing, again from Shaheen, when accessing private data of client, if Google or some similar search engine may access it, how can we prevent it? When you say uh, Google or Google will access it, so <clears throat> so again, I, as I said, I, I don't understand the question. But um, once that uh, an organization collects the data, right, for, of of the customer, and it may be directly the customer providing or you collecting it through mobile apps. Uh, or um, uh, or uh, collecting from third parties, right? Then it becomes your um, once it enters your organization, it it needs to need to ensure that uh, the data is protected, right? Uh, it's also important. Let's say, for example, you you are you develop the um, uh, third party uh, or you've developed the mobile app, right? So as you rightly said. Google and uh, you have third party uh, uh, functionalities that they're called SDKs that right? they use to develop these apps, right? It, it accelerates the process. So a lot of organizations use these third party SDKs uh, to develop the app. And as part of these third party SDKs, your data also goes out, right? To, to these. Uh, so it's important when an organization uh, develops these apps that they have a clear understanding of what kind of third party SDKs that they use. So are their data going to Google? Facebook, right? Um, try and avoid using these third party SDKs to the extent possible. These SDKs have their own privacy policies. So you know, understand as to how the data is being used, right? So it's important to understand that as well. 
right um and uh, the, the ensuring that you don't lose the uh, sdks without really thinking about it and uh, document all this as part of your internal process so one of the services that we provide is something called as privacy testing so uh, for our clients we test their mobile apps to understand what permissions are they taking really do they need these permissions uh, which third parties are they sending the data to uh, what are the functionalities is it for advertising is it for analytics so we document it and ask them okay do you really need these services um, and um, what are the downsides of using this right so so it's it's important that the organization is aware that um they, they, they even though they are collecting the data are they really send sharing it with third parties uh, like google or facebook yeah avoid that uh, or at least be understand the functionalities and how the data will be processed there so that you are clear in your head as to how the data will be used okay uh, the other question is uh, what about cas doing tax practice having personal data of clients uh because as uh, you know as part of the uh, tax uh, work we do get access to a lot of the personal data so i guess uh the cas also who uh, get access to personal data will need to ensure that they have the right measures put in place to ensure the data is protected correct correct so one of the first thing that again this would you will have to look into this but i i am assuming when a client is providing their data for tax related purposes it's uh they are voluntarily submitting it so the legal ground may be voluntary submission of data right because you're using it to provide a service a similar example which i gave it's zomato you um, you have to will have to process your personal address to send you the food right so similarly you will have, the, the client will have to share those bank account related details etc etc to for you to do your job um, effectively as a um, as an accountant right so i suspect that consent may not be the legal ground but voluntary submission may be the legal ground you may want to use Uh, however once the data is coming in uh, how do you protect it right how what kind of measures you have what kind of systems are you keeping it with are you sharing it with another third party are you using another vendor right what kind of protection you do you have in that regard right so all those other processes you will definitely have to put in place yeah and also as a uh, i mean you may be running a firm with employees as well so employee data may also be you may also be processing em- employee data as well but purely from a customer data for tax related purpose i think the legal ground is fine i think voluntary submission um, and you need to ensure that you ask for only the information that you would absolutely need to file the tax right nothing in excess so these are some of the things you will have to take care of but i think that legal ground would be that voluntary submission yeah Okay. The last question we have is uh, uh, no, the second last question. We are getting a lot of calls from various marketing of goods and services. How did they obtain the data? Is this a data compromise? Um. So um. So as I said, the way it typically works is um. organizations may um let's say the marketing team may have collected your data when you visit their website or download their app but a lot of times they also collect it from a third party right let's say they want certain leads they want to market their product to and they don't have a ready made set so they may go to a data broker right now this particular data broker we don't know how they have procured the data right so they may have procured the data through uh legitimate means or saying that okay we we are collecting your data you attending this conference i'm collecting your data but i will be sharing it with people who have sponsored this just as an example right so some organization some brokers would be making it clear to the um user that hey your data may be used for xyz purposes some may not be right most of them may not right uh, so as an organization um when you're taking collecting this uh, using this data from third parties it's important to really understand what processes they followed to collect the data right uh, next is when you as an organization are sending 
marketing mailers to this individual um you need to ensure that they have a copy of your notice and they also have an option to uh, really uh, unsubscribe from whatever service that you are trying to provide right so that those options should be provided so coming back to your question it it's not it may be a compromise of your data or may not be i mean it depends on how the data has been collected and then shared with, with the organization which is eventually reaching out to you correct and um, uh, the last question is whether any other qualification is required for a ca for becoming data auditor uh, disa is sufficient is that correct uh, they need he needs your views this is sony cl what is disa sorry so this is a certification course i think you have already spoken about the um, various um, trainings and certifications one of your slides did cover that right in terms of what would be required for the uh, for us to get into this uh, field so uh, so the government does not really come out with what should be the qualifications for the auditor right so they have not really come up with some uh, any any specifics as of now we'll have to just wait for that uh these are some of the trainings which uh, we uh, recommend certifications these are again the ones available currently right uh, these are the most popular ones if you're looking for something in india then the dcpp which is the dscy certified privacy professional or the dscy certified privacy lead auditor right these are two courses which is locally recognize if you want to some something international right then cipm the certified information privacy manager is something that you want to go for this is recognized broadly internationally so iipp is the largest uh, international body of privacy professionals in fact if you log on to their website it's like a treasure trove of knowledge if you are serious about getting into this field right it's just a fantastic storehouse of knowledge um but again specific uh, courses and what the government will recognize is something only once they uh, the the the, the, uh, the rules will come out i'm sure they will provide some more specifics but these are some industry recognized courses which i'm listing out here yeah yeah because the um, ICI does have this uh, DSA which is the information system audit diploma but that i think is more general whereas what we are looking at through uh, this particular uh, requirement is very specific to uh, right. the these are data privacy. privacy yeah yeah these are specific to data privacy these courses correct 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 uh, just let me see um, yes hope ici will come with a course is what kutalingam says and uh, i'm sure they will come up with that some more questions when conducting an audit the data principal being the audited can they ask us during the course of audit what we are doing with it as sometimes we would want to keep it a secret during processing no i as a data fiduciary you mean right as an organization no i think so yeah hmm. so the data principal is the one who is being audited by us the client and can they ask us a question that the data hmm. that you are that we are taking from them what do you intend doing so again the, data, the data principal is the person whose data is being taken right so correct correct a, yeah so data so so is the question as the, whether the data principal can ask yes organization yes uh, because he is saying as sometimes we would want to keep it a secret during processing so for example you know sandeep i'll just uh, tell you like say i ask for a vendor master from my client okay and um i then do some kind of analysis on that say i want to look at okay what kind of uh, is there a concentration of vendors do i see a similar uh, pan being given against different vendors are there any bogus vendors do i see you know that kind of analysis one does and one may not sit down and explain to the client beforehand what kind of reviews i intend conducting on the master that has been given to me by them so the question here he is asking ramchandra is asking is that 
can they ask us during the course of the audit what we are doing with it as sometimes we would want to keep it a secret during processing um that is a good question but i think you will have to at least give it a mention it at a very high level right as to what um, what you intend to do and you can say that i want to assess the vendors right it's something uh, you do you need not go and tell them okay i'm going to look at i'm going to do this particular um, uh stratification and really do these types of analysis but broadly you can say i want to ensure that the from a third party perspective um, the compliance needs are being met right you can it could be a rather a high level statement rather than really getting into the specifics of it so sure. again this is what i recommend at this point knowing very little about uh, how how it really works on the ground but it's it's an equivalent to let's say uh, in in the eu and all they talk about um, if there is automated processing right it could be like someone is using ai to um recruit people uh, with for the organization or to decide who gets the loan or not uh, the law says that you need to mention um, um the logic that you are using as part of the program now obviously that these logic is obviously is going to be ip right to an organization but still that at a very high level they need to provide that hey we consider these these factors or something like that to to at least um uh, provide some in some insight into what what they do right but definitely they can't reveal their secret sauce so it's it's a similar situation i would say out here there is one more question we need to provide the details of the process i think only the purpose will need to be disclosed uh, we in what context how we intend to uh nimin um i i don't know i believe what he is talking about is uh, uh how we will process the data i think it's uh, you know tagged on to the previous question when somebody said that do we need to explain what pro- what we are going to do uh, with the data that we are collecting it so do we need to provide the details or, or only the purpose like you, as you said jo- generally give them an idea without getting into the specifics should probably uh, meet the requirements correct yes yeah Pre- and nemen has confirmed that it was with the previous question that we had so uh, i think um, that those were the questions that we received uh, sandeep uh, i have the pleasant task of also proposing the vote of thanks on behalf of the bombay chartered accountant society uh as uh, you know it's a, uh, what what as a, a chartered accountant i see is that the landscape is becoming more and more structured for a ca to operate it, uh within um lot of rules coming in and uh, yes these help because then you are very sure which side of the law you need to be on rather than it being something which is left totally to uh, us to decide what is how do we maintain data what do we do with it uh, a few key takeaways if i may just quickly talk about i uh, in your uh, you know address to us was one is in terms of what are the legal grounds for processing the personal data is a very critical factor we need to ensure that we have the consent which needs to be documented a clear purpose needs to be stated why it is being processed and ensuring that we use the data for the process that was state it was stated for and then deleting the data of course the uh, role of having impact assessments audits uh, and um, various other measures to ensure that the data is being kept in the way it is required to be uh, it is safeguarded by us a uh, right to nominate was something which you said was very unusual in the indian context that we have a uh, right to nominate which the data has of uh, and the huge penalties i think everybody has probably sat up in their chairs looking at the kind of penalties that are uh, being put in place because that will definitely uh, get uh, everybody's you know antennas up and say that okay we need to do uh, we need to take certain steps uh, in terms of a personal data attribute map um, yes 
what kind of data are we going to process what are the channels how do we maintain it where is it going to be stored how will it flow and what is it going to be used for you also spoke about the staff training because ensuring that everybody is on the same page uh, is a very critical aspect uh, use of privacy management platforms is also something that as auditors we may consider uh, because especially for the smaller firms it becomes critical uh, there is a limitation in terms of the ability to hire someone who will only specifically look at uh, this and have a data protection officer for managing this entire thing and the opportunities that you highlighted in terms of being auditors or consultants or even the data protection officers of course after obtaining the various trainings and certifications so thank you very much and of course once this becomes an act and the rules are uh, you know also released we will definitely look at having you back because it's like something like picture abhi baki hai we have just got a trailer uh, to what is coming uh, and uh, we look forward to hear, having you hosting you again and uh, hearing from you what other things can be done for uh, by us as chartered accountants to ensure that we follow the rule of the land so thank you very much on behalf of the bombay chartered accountant society uh, i extend a thank you a warm um, you know uh, please give my regards to shivani uh, she has been instrumental in getting you and we have been absolutely uh, you know honored to have you thank you so much and thank you all for being part of this lovely evening i'm sure you will have more questions if there are any questions please share them with us and we will reach them to sandeep uh, and this video recording will also be available on youtube uh, for um, you know anyone to listen to at a later date or you know share it with your friends and your uh, clients so thank you so much sandeep and uh, thank you yeah